Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us, whether you're watching on video or listening on our podcast show. We are always excited to share important information with you. I'm Jill Bloom, publisher of Roofing Contractor, Walls and Ceilings, and Building and Closure, and our legal expert, Trent Cotney, the CEO of Cotney Attorneys and Consultants, is here today to provide us the insights and the answers to all the questions regarding pressing issues to help you manage your construction business better. And there's no doubt Trent and us at Roofing Contractor and Walls and Ceilings share the same passion to better this incredible industry. So Trent, thank you so much for joining me today. Jill, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking about uh, this new OSHA standard. I think it's, it's, we've gotten so many questions on it. I know our listeners are really going to be interested in this. Oh, there's no doubt. And like you said, your phone's been blowing up and so is mine as well. Uh, so when you look at this new temporary standard uh, for the, ma the mandate of the vaccination and sound, you know, last week, of course, the stay was put in place, but let's just start just with kind of the basics. Can you just talk about the stay? What does that mean? And what, um, and we can get the, just the conversation started because there's so <laughs> many questions. Absolutely. So let's take a step back and talk about what the standard is, right? There's a lot of confusion, a lot of questions about it. And I want to start at the beginning. So okay. uh, November 5th, the OSHA emergency temporary standard was passed. And the high level view of it is you're, if you have over 100 employees and you're a private employer, then you have to make sure that your employees are either vaccinated or engage in regular testing and wear masks and follow CDC guidelines, okay? So that is, is the high level view. Um, according to the uh, OSHA ETS, the Emergency Temporary Standard, the majority of the things that you have to do under that standard have to be completed within 30 days or December 5th, okay? And then as of January 4th, 2022, you have to engage in regular testing for those employees that are unvaccinated. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other requirements. That was the highest level. I'm going to go right. down. I was at, I was at 35,000 feet. I'm coming down to 10,000 now. So, okay, great. And the emergency temporary standard is 500 pages and you can tell it was written by policymakers and, and lawyers because it doesn't make a lot of sense. But when you unpack it, um, there's some things that em employers must do. Okay. The first thing that they have to do is they've got to make sure that they have an employee policy that tracks the requirements of the emergency temporary standard. Okay, if they don't already have something uh, that is as good or better. So, for example, if an employer already has a mandatory vaccination policy, then they don't have to create another one because they're already saying there is no testing option. Everybody has to be vaccinated. Right. The next thing that they have to do is they have to create a ledger of all the employees, and then they have to uh, mark whether or not they are vaccinated or they are subject to regular testing. This is a separate ledger, okay? In addition to that, OSHA is requiring that the employer maintain proof of vaccination, okay? So it can be an original vaccination document or it can be a scan or a PDF or something like that, but they have to maintain that. They also have to maintain evidence of testing, and we'll talk a little bit later about what testing means, but they've got to be able to show that, and they must test at least weekly. At least you can test more than that, but at a minimum, you must do weekly. So that ledger, all the documents pertaining to proof of vaccination and testing, those are all considered medical records, which need to be kept separate from employee files. I had somebody ask me recently, well, Trent, I have other medical records. Can I just include them in that? No, you can't because OSHA has said that if I come knocking on your door and I ask for these documents, you have to give them to me in four hours. So you better have them at, you know, either digitally in a folder or in a separate folder so that you can produce them as quickly as possible. Um, the other component to this rule is that there's an education part of it. Uh, employers must um, teach employees on four things. One, the ETS. They've got to explain what the standard is, uh, what to do, and all that kind of stuff, right? The next thing is they, they have to explain why vaccines are good. Uh, there's a CDC document called the Keys, 
key reasons to get vaccinated. It's on OSHA.gov and it's on the CDC website. And it explains that, right? The third thing is, is they have to identify the OSHA whistleblower policy uh, in general and as it relates to the CTS for the employee. So if an employee feels like an employer is a scoff law and isn't paying attention to this, then you must educate them on how to whistleblow. And then the fourth thing is, is that you have to tell them about the criminal penalties associated with faking a vaccination. Okay, it could be $10,000 fine and or a uh, six month sentence. So um, it is pretty significant. We have had some issues with fake vaccination cards. So it's becoming more of a thing, um, you know, depending on what, what state you're in, what jurisdiction you're in, you know, there may be a, a different tendency to prosecute, but definitely don't wanna, um, you know, mess around with that. So those are just, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Those are, are some of the high level things. Again, this is the 10,000 foot view uh, of some of the things that em employers must do here in short order. That's a lot, there's no doubt. So let's, um, I guess my first question is, is how do you determine if, how does a contractor, an employer determine if they have a hundred employees? I mean, some people work from home, some people work outside, some people, you know, are part-time. Like what, how do you figure that out? Sure, so um, that is a very detailed question. So I'm gonna unpack it here. And so start with hundred employees. To determine what, how many employees you have, you have to look at how many people were on the payroll on November 5th, okay? If you have 100 employees on November 5th, but for some reason, let's say December 5th, you go down to 90, it doesn't matter. You're still covered by the ETS. If you have 100 employees on November 5th and you have one employee on December 5th, you still have to follow the emergency temporary standard. Keep in mind that this emergency temporary standard is only valid for six months. It only goes till May 2022. Then at that point, OSHA needs to determine whether or not it will make it a permanent standard. Okay. So during the entire pendency of uh, the ETS, if you if you ever hit over a hundred, you are from that point forward, you are governed by it. Okay. So another example, let's say on November 5th, you had 90 employees, but then December 5th, you have 100. Well, from December 5th on, you're subject to the ETS, okay? Um, do part-time employees count to the 100? Yes, they do. So if you have part-time employees, they count. Do, um, let's say you use a staffing agency. Does the staffing agency's employees count uh, towards your 100? They don't count towards the host employer, but they do count towards the staffing agency. Okay, so the answer there for most contractors is probably no, they don't count towards your 100. Uh, let's say you have workers that only work from home uh, or you have outdoor workers, right? Or you have any other type of worker that you can think of that's a payroll worker. Do they count for the 100? Yes, okay, but there are exceptions where some of them don't have to comply with ETS. We'll get into that. Last thing I wanna mention on how do you calculate 100 is does independent contractors count? So by independent contractor, I mean people that you pay on a 1099 basis. Now with roofing contractors, building envelope contractors and other trades, there is a tendency to pay uh, salespeople 1099, to pay labor 1099. And one of the big issues we've talked about it you know, before is misclassification. So the Biden administration has already, you know, signaled that it really wants to focus on contractors that are not properly classifying their 1099 work, their 1099 uh, independent contractors. And you could potentially see an issue where you've got um, somebody that might have 70 employees and 30 independent contractors. If OSHA comes looking and starts investigating and realizes that, you know, your other 30, they only work for you, they don't work for anybody else, they wear your your safety gear, they report to you only. You might have a misclassification right. issue and you may end up being subject there. So that's something to watch out for. But really all they're looking for right now is payroll, okay? Payroll W-2 employees. Let's get into the exceptions, okay? okay. Uh, if you have workers that only work from home, do they have to, do they count to the 100? Yes, they do count to the 100, but they don't have to comply with the standard, okay? 
um, it's kind of dumb to, you know, wear a mask at home if you, you know, <laughs> don't have anything else going on. Sure. But keep, keep in mind, the standard says you have to either be vaccinated or you have to test and wear a mask. Okay. So as of December 5th, you got to start wearing a mask in the workplace um, and follow other CDC guidelines like social distancing and that kind of stuff. So remote workers don't have to comply with it. Um, the other uh, issue is outdoor workers. So this is the question that I get the most from contractors. Well, can I, all my crew work outdoors. Does that count? Uh, kind of. Um, the definition of outdoor worker says that they only wear outdoors, obviously. Um, they have what they call de minimis contact with any kind of home office, which means as minimal as possible. So if they're spending two hours a day in your home office and then going out in the field, that doesn't count. Here's the, here's the kicker. Uh, you can't share crew cabs. You can't share equipment. So if they're riding in company vehicles, if they report to the job site and then six of them get in a crew cab and take off, it doesn't count. Then they're, they're subject to the um, requirements. I had somebody call me on Saturday saying, what if I just have more masks while they're in the crew cab? That's great, but that's not, that doesn't meet the exception. They're still doing that. So unless there's additional guidance that comes out, in order to be an outdoor worker, you can drive from home directly to the job site. You can drive in separate trucks. You know, you can do anything you want. They got to only work outdoors. They can't hang out in the office very long. They can come in and out briefly, but that's about it. Okay. That um, sounds extremely restrictive. I mean, that's just. It is. So. Let me tell you one of the things that we're doing for content. Like, keep in mind, for those of you that are listening to this, I have a safety background. I've got an OSHA 10, OSHA 30. I know all that stuff, but I am not a safety professional. I am a risk mitigation professional uh, mm -hmm. as a lawyer. So what I do is I try to figure out how, how can I help contractors legally comply with this? One of the things that I'm doing is I'm creating an outdoor worker policy that specifically states these are the requirements of the ETS, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Employee, you understand this and you agree to comply with it. Please sign here. Now, if for some reason they don't comply with that, then you may have a traditional OSHA defense known as unpermittable employee misconduct, meaning I trained them. I did everything I was supposed to do. I told them they shouldn't share a truck, but they did it anyway. Now, if they're coming into your office and they're using your trucks, then it's kind of hard to say, well, I, I didn't know they were using my truck. But the idea is you want to paper the file there and you want to shift some of that burden on the employees to the extent that you can if you're going to try to meet that exception. Um, the other thing that I should mention is for calculating the 100, let's say you are a company that's got multiple offices. So let's say you're based, uh, you know, I'm talking to you now in California. Let's say you're based here in California, but you've got offices in Florida and everywhere else. Uh, if it's the same corporation, all the offices count towards the hundred. Okay, they're looking at, at single corporation ownership. So right now, there isn't a definition for affiliate, meaning partial ownership in another company. However, if you look towards other things that OSHA has done and other mandates, like the, the federal contractor mandate, they have defined affiliate and they have wrote that in. So I would expect that if this thing survives legal scrutiny, that at some point, you know, uh, sister companies could be included within whether or not you meet the 100 threshold. Yeah, so um, as long as they're owned by the same company, because we know there's lots of businesses in our industries that yeah, fall under that. As for right now, they're just looking for single 100. entity, single corporation, no matter where you're at, do you have 100 employees? So basically November 5th was is the main date. This is before, I mean, November that's 5th how is they probably, got you. yeah, right. So before you even knew what you needed to know, you're, stuck. you're either stuck or not unstuck and don't get stuck if you want to stay under hundred employees. Yeah. 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 You got to, yeah. I, my recommendation is, is just, just the admin burden alone is, is hefty, you know, having to keep all this, having to engage in it, having to figure it out. It's, it's a, it's a lot for employers to have to do. So if you're on the edge of that trend, can you actually change your company name? Um, you can. Would you, you like, would that even be worth it to stay away from this? If you had, if you went from 110 employees down to 90? 
Yeah, because if you're already at it, you're already in it. So it doesn't matter what you do at this point. You okay. know, if, if you, you know, if you have 90, you know, November 5th, then you're still at 90 and you want to hire 10 more, then maybe you, you think about something. But right. uh, that's a lot to do in a short amount of time. And sure. honestly, I don't know if the, if the uh, benefit would outweigh the, the, uh, the cost and the risk associated with it. Right. So, you know, Trent, there's so many states that have already uh, filed lawsuits to hold off these mandates. Um, what, what do those look like and how does that mean? Like, I think Florida is one of them. I think Texas was another. Um, yeah. So tons of lawsuits, right? I mean, the one that right. has gained the most notoriety is the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And for those that don't um, understand the hierarchy, it's one level below the U.S. Supreme Court. So okay. it's, it's getting up there pretty high. Um, and that uh, Fifth Circuit covers uh, Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And um, what happened there is uh, the states and some private entities, uh, a whole bunch of other uh, petitioners got together and said, hey, um, this standard is, is unconstitutional. There's a lot of different legal issues with this. It presents an imminent threat, and we deserve to have this temporary stay put, put in place uh, until the court can figure out whether or not it wants to you know, create a permanent stay. So the Fifth Circuit uh, looked at it, and one day after uh, it was announced, November 6th, the Fifth Circuit said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do that. Um, last week, OSHA responded, and uh, the petitioners replied to that. And the court again on Friday said, yep, there's, there's a lot of issues here. We're putting in a temporary stay, okay? And unpack some of the legal issues just so that, that our listeners understand you know, uh, and let me take a step back. I'm all for safety, right? But uh, I also think I'm also a business owner. <laughs> and I think, I think there, you have to be able, this, this is not a safety driven, in my opinion, this is driven by the desire to mandate vaccines, not by a grave danger or imminent threat, which was the justification for coming out with an emergency temporary standard. Anytime you come out with an emergency temporary standard, there has to be a grave danger, right? I don't think this is a, a known threat. And here's the big thing, Jill, is last year, if you remember, mm -hmm. OSHA already did this analysis. They were talking about doing an emergency temporary standard for COVID-19. And the only one they did it for was healthcare. They didn't even do it for construction or general industry. And it's because they didn't view it as at that time as a grave danger. So when OSHA was told by the Biden administration to do this, they were actually upset about it. <laughs> Because, oh, interesting. Yeah, there's a Time Magazine article on it that really goes through in detail. But um, there's that issue. There is uh, a lot of issues, you know, the Commerce Clause, you know, our state's rights versus federal rights. This federal law preempts state mandates that say otherwise, like Texas and Florida, where they've said absolutely no, no vax mandate whatsoever. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of issues with regard. You know, are you telling me that if I have 99 employees, I'm suddenly safe from this grave danger? Why? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, there's so many a... details, Trent. There's no doubt. There's so many details. And I know that it, it's got like you said, your phone's been blowing up. So people are yeah. overwhelmed with how, where to start. But what's what's the most important thing everybody needs to know today? How do we close this out for just what we know today right now? Yeah. So uh, two things I mentioned, one on the testing side, you can use over the counter. OK, you can okay. use over the counter. And that's a quick test. You know, um, it can't be self-administered or self-proctored, so the employer can look over that, um, or a healthcare professional. Uh, but that makes it a little bit easier on you, uh, a little bit quicker. The other thing I would say is, uh, if you go to OSHA.gov and you search uh, OSHA ETS uh, COVID-19 FAQ, uh, FAQ, there is a great um fact section that's put together that is very, very detailed that really goes into a lot of the different questions. Really recommend that. And obviously we'll keep putting out content as well. It's an ever-changing thing. You can anticipate there will be changes, you know, probably next week on this. So absolutely. Well Trent, thank you so much. We're going to get this posted right away so people can dive in and try to understand. And again, like you said, it's changing all the time. So we'll, we'll continue to spend some time with you and keep updating folks. We really appreciate your time. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Trent or any of his incredible team of attorneys, it's cottonycl.com. And if you have any questions for me or anybody at Walls and Ceilings or Roofing Contractor or Building Enclosure, it's roofingcontractor.com, wconline.com, buildingenclosureonline.com, 
And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free e-newsletters, our free e-magazines, register for the website so you're always up to date on all the content that we're posting. But most importantly, please stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks again, Trent. Thanks.